let me say welcome to everybody who's joined us today. Uh, I'm I'm delighted that Bill Malik has joined us uh, for this talk. Those of you who've been attending serious symposia or actually many different conferences over the years uh, will recognize uh, Mr. Malik. He has spoken here uh, at least not not formally at the uh, symposium, but with people who visited. Uh, he's I, I've seen him at other conferences where he has presented some fascinating talks. And we're overdue for for having him here presenting at uh, this session today. Um, so he's going to talk about something that I think is near and dear to many people who practice in security, and that is multi-factor uh, um, authentication. And so let me remind everybody in the audience, if you have a question uh, for, for Bill or want to share a comment, please put it in the Q&A and not the chat, and we will get to it at the end of his talk. And so without further ado, uh, Bill, welcome and take it away, please. Thank you very much, Beth. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here, and I hope you find this uh, useful and informative. I'm happy to take any questions. I will tell you uh, there are things I don't know, and I will immediately step up when I say, gee, I don't know how that uh, that could work. So let me get into this uh, uh, material, and we will uh, proceed. So the question is, um, what is multi-factor authentication? What's, what's going on with it? Um, as Spaff said, I've I've been in the business a while. Um, I met I met uh, the professor uh, when we were briefing Sam Nunn in the late '90s. Uh, I think it was either Y2K or privacy or some such. Don't remember. Uh, worked at Gartner for 11 years. I was one of the founders of the information security service there. Uh, wrote code for IBM in the '80s. Uh, was with Trend Micro uh, for the past uh, seven years and um, now in an independent consulting role. So let's let's move quickly through this. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got ten Gladwells, uh, but hopefully this this will show you that I can at least get out of the the shallow rough. So the question is, what is authentication? We're going to talk about the relative strengths. We'll talk about some of the attacks. Uh, I'm not going to be strict about saying this one is worse than that. I just want to give you a survey, a sense of the big problem. We're going to focus in on pass keys, which I think are the strongest available solution to get rid of the problems with uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, and that's gonna lead to a brief comment on the future problems with public key encryption. A very wide open suspect uh, subject is how long will the methods we're using for public key, which is the core for path keys um, until they become uh, vulnerable as well. Um, so uh, let's begin. You're talking to a computer and you want to prove you are who you say you are. So you're going to give it something you know or something you forgot, something you have or something you lost. Uh, and you're going to try to back that up with something you are or used to be. Um, I don't mean to be glib about this, uh, but the fact is that people forget passwords all the time. Um, and part of it's our own fault. Back in the 90s, somebody asked NIST, what a standard is for a good password. And they came out with the recommendations that we all know and hate. It's got to have a mixture of upper and lower case, letters, numbers, special symbols, and you should change it every 48 hours or whatever. Um, almost all of that is bad advice. Uh, the thing you want with a password, and this will come up at the end, is you just want it to be long. Long is good. More characters gives you much more. And it makes it easier to remember. The The old saw against this is if it's something you know, then it's either going to be easy to remember, which means it's easy to guess, or it's hard to remember, which means you write it down. Well, I'd like to suggest that a long password is something that is easy to remember and hard to guess. And an example would be, I just look around for you know a book and one. Here's one now. Cybersecurity myths and misconceptions, and I flip it open to page 196, and I read, if you're in business, you should have an attorney. That's a really nice password. 
Now, you can put a bookmark on that page. And even if somebody gets into your office and finds the book and finds the bookmark out of all the books and all the other bookmarks you have, they still don't know which sentence or how long. And if you've got 26 characters in that sentence, you've got something like six times 10 to the 36th power combinations. And that's sufficient to avoid uh, any kind of hack. So that's that's about passwords. I won't say anything about them again until we get to the end. Uh, so now we come down to something you have, some kind of a key, a device, a token, um, an assistance of some kind, your cell phone, for example. And then we'll talk about biometrics uh, a little bit later. So here are the things that you might have. Passkey, very strong, uses public key infrastructure. And the nice thing about this and the FIDO and SAML basis is that it does not require that you have a session token on your machine that contains the credential. What you have with a passkey is a private key. And in the negotiation with the website that you're talking to, they'll use the corresponding public key to be able to generate a message which is sent back and forth. And that establishes uh, the authentication. Uh, other, other techniques for this, you can have a token with a time-dependent one-time password like the uh, secure ID card. Um, not widely known, although now that the uh, handcuffs have come off, there was an incident about 13 years ago where the core the root uh, generator for the secure ID card itself was uh, was stolen, and there was an interesting scurry to get them uh, updated. But it was a it was a big problem. Um, secure IDs are tough. Biometrics. I I do want to see this about biometrics, and that is they're they're vulnerable. I mean, it's a very strong assertion of who you are, but it's not an authentication method because you can't really change it. I mean, if somebody grabs your fingerprint, you're not going to get, you know, a new set of fingers. Uh, those who've been around for a while may remember the days when you actually got a dongle. Uh, in the original sense, that was a device that fit into the printer port. So you'd get a copy of Aldous PageMaker. And in order to use it on your computer, you'd have to put this into the printer port and that contained the key. And then you have passwords with various complexity, PIN, simple, or hard-coded password, which leads to all sorts of problems. We know, for instance, that uh, hacking hard-coded passwords, whether they're accidentally stored in a user file or stored in a GitHub repository or stored in a message to a customer, leads to all sorts of problems. And I do have a list of references, and some of those include pointers uh, to cases where a hard-coded password was, uh, was, in fact, hacked and corrupted. So here's probably one of the two most important uh, charts in the deck. Uh, how do you attack these various kinds of things? Now, these are not sorted by relative strength. I just wanted to put them out there. Uh, how do you go after a password? You can try to guess, spray and pray. Uh, passwords are stolen often. There are companies that sell passwords for 15 or 20 bucks a piece and up, depending upon what it is, if it's a password to a you know, like how to how to handle a local admin account or you know, how to administer a security technology. That'll cost you a little bit more. Brute force, you just keep whacking on a password. The best way to defeat a brute force attack is simply to, you know, time out the number of passes. Now, you could either lock up the account after five failed tries, which is pretty good for somebody to go through, you know, part two, which is a social engineering attack. Um, or you just increase the length of time, you know, indefinitely. Every time you hack, it's going to take you twice as long to get through. Uh, credential stuffing attacks. I'm just going to keep going after you until you knuckle under. Uh, if it's a physical device like a dongle, it can be stolen. I suppose you could probably get a copy of it and, and make your own copy of the dongle. Those are somewhat obsolete. For one-time passwords, um, here we're looking at some sophisticated at techniques involving man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, that means directing somebody to a dummy site and then using a very fast messaging system like Telegram to pretend that you're the site the user really wants to get to and try to act in a software sense like the shim in an ATM that's going to read the card's data while the card is transacting business. Steal a cookie, you can recreate that. 
sim swapping is uh, a particularly interesting problem. And that is if somebody can get your phone carrier to assign your phone to another device, essentially obsoleting your SIM, putting theirs in, they now have the ability to receive messages on your behalf. Uh, there was a fellow just arrested in Florida a few weeks ago for SIM swap attacks. And in fact, it now turns out in an article that Brian Krebs just published today, that he was a member of a gang that did a whole lot of this stuff. It's an interesting read. Um, what actually was going on. And it's it's a real criminal underground. I mean, there these sim swapping gangs actually, in one instance, kidnapped the member of one gang and beat him up and held him for ransom. They wanted an equal cut of the extortion from some attack that they both worked on. Uh, MFA fatigue is you you get a site and it says, you know, please enter password and you ignore, ignore, ignore. And finally, you just say, okay, and now the bad guy's in just because you got uh, tired. I mentioned the RSA security hack where somebody was able to generate their own keys and social engineering. You, you know, talk nicely to the person the help desk and they give you access. Um, I've heard versions where people have used um, voice generators to mimic the sound. You get a call. It sounds like the CEO who says, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in a bad spot. So uh, yeah, I need you to reset my password. Look, I'm gonna, I can't really hear you. I'm gonna have to go to messaging. And so now you're involved in a text message session with somebody who you can't authenticate. Um, it was social engineering that allowed the MGM hack to happen. And they did have authentication in place, but they you know, managed to uh, let somebody get a, a privileged account and off to the, uh, off to the races they went. Stealing a session cookie, sometimes called pass the hash, is a way to uh, to break uh, token-based authentication as well. In the case of PKI-based, um, in order to solve that, you have to crack a hard math problem. And this is going to come into play when I talk about recommendations. Uh, the way public key works, you have a, uh, a prime number and then you have a composite number, which is the factor of a number of primes. The prime number is the private key. The composite number is the uh, public key. And figuring, creating a public key for a bunch of prime numbers is easy to multiply them. But if I give you a really big, like 140 digit long public key and ask you to get the prime factors, that problem's complexity increases exponentially. We have no easy way to do that. So reverse engineering that, whether it's um, uh, you know factoring large numbers or whether it's elliptical curve, there are a couple of other mechanisms. That's just a hard problem. And those are fairly resilient for a certain amount of time anyway. Now, it turns out that even a passkey, and, and I'm a fan, I got a I got my YubiKey just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you always buy them in pairs because you have to provision them at the same time. If somebody could provision one later, then they could get a second key and say they're the new mate to yours and they provision theirs. And now that you have a clone and you don't know it. So you have to buy two. My other one's in a drawer over there. Uh, don't tell anybody. Um, but it turns out that if you have access to the machine and you have local access to the pass key, what you do is you set the clock forward like, you know, five years and then you just ask it to generate a series of uh, keys. You record those, and then you set the clock back and wait. Um, the hack that I saw, and there's a write-up mentioned in the thing, will take you five hours of time. But yeah, that's that's true, but if you have five hours underfunded access to the machine and to the pass keys, you're not gonna spend it doing that. You're gonna be doing all sorts of other stuff. The last point about attacks that I want to make has to do with bio, attacks on biometrics. Now, biometrics consist of some sort of measure that's supposed to be unique to us. Uh, fingerprints are supposed to be unique. I, I think there's an argument that says they may not actually be, but the likelihood of a, of a hit is so slim that you know, operationally it seems to be. The reason I bring this up as being subject to attacks is you can get a copy of a fingerprint. I think Woody Allen did it in the movie Sleeper. Um, 4K video is robust enough that you can actually, if you're looking at a large close-up picture of a celebrity or a political figure, you can get a viable iris scan off of the video image. Uh, voice recording technology is quite high. Uh, 
you know, my name is Bill and my voice is my passport. If you remember the movie Sneakers, uh, deep fakes and so on. So this, this is a summary of the kinds of attacks we see. Um, again, um, you know, not meant to be um, comprehensive, but just to hit the, uh, the highlights. Um, this shows a one-time password against, against the YubiKey. Now here, the YubiKey is vulnerable because it doesn't have a battery or a clock. It takes its clock from an external source. So if you can mess with a clock on an external source, you can fool the YubiKey into showing you a series of uh, one-time passwords for some future date. And you can store those up and use them later. The alternative using, say, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, Secure ID Card, they carry their own clock. So it's harder to do that. But again, uh, that's nation state actor level uh, sophistication. The most recent uh, of the attacks against um, uh, smart devices is uh, Evil Genix. Uh, there are a couple of tutorials available on YouTube. There's a whole pack of documentation on uh, uh, GitHub. Uh, and this is from one of those documents. What you do is you uh, sneak a fake login page to the user, you capture their credentials on the way through. It's kind of like a man in the middle attack, but it steps up the game a little bit because what you're gonna do is, again, act like that shim, you're gonna pass the credential onto the real target. And then when the response come back, you echo it back to the user who doesn't know they're fished. You're using something very fast to get back and forth. That sort of thing can be uh, nasty and it doesn't require anything, any prior knowledge. You just have to convince the user to click onto a uh, a spoofed site and you get there. And the spoofed sites can be pretty sophisticated. Here's the, here's the spoofed site for uh, getting into Microsoft. I mean, it says HTTPS, yes. Login.outlook.live, yep. .com, .nofish.com. Wait, wait, what's that part? Well, there you are. That's, that's how they will get it in. And it looks current. Um, it will respond exactly as you respond. They're using fast messaging. It's a very thin shim that they're putting in place and they will be able to take over the session. So take a time, take a moment to look at the URL. The lock itself is not enough to uh, guarantee that you're, uh, you're secure. Um, there have been, there was a, a period when people said, if you see the lock, it's secure. Well, unfortunately, no. The other thing to look out for is when you log into a site, like your bank, and you get a message, thank you, um, browser gods for this, you get a message that says, this site is not secure because it is not HTTPS. Uh, that means somebody has managed to insert something on the way. Back out, find the address you want to go through through a Google search, and go to the canonical site. You should never see a message from a reputable bank, fiduciary, or a major corporation that says this site is not legit. If you see it, someone somewhere is doing something to your site. So look out for that. So you say, wow, these are these are tough problems. I'm not gonna do a password. Slam slang it, I'm gonna set up an authentication server all by myself. And so you decide to build an authentication server. So and here's what's involved. You're gonna have to buy, or, buy some hardware it's going to be blank. So you're going to install OS. You're going to configure the network to accept it. You're going to deploy authentication software. You're not going to write it yourself. You're going to download it from GitHub. And you can trust GitHub because thousands of people have looked at the code, right? No. <laughs> there have been GitHub hacks that are decades old. Most of the TCP IP stacks that are available on GitHub have gaping holes that date back to the early teens. So you can roll a user and say, well, yeah, I'm not going to build my own authentication server. I'm going to buy a service to outsource it. Who are the really big outsourcers who could build me an authentication server? Well, how about Okta? Sadly, as with Microsoft and as with so many others, um, they also were hacked. Um, in the case of Okta, uh, one of their customer service uh, personnel saved a service account credential in their personal uh, Google account, which was then hacked. The hackers took the customer service account. Now, service account isn't run by a person. It's invoked by 
another system. So it doesn't use MFA. It uses a static password. I mean, you can go in and manually change the password, but then you have to change the script that does it. And once you've got a service account, you can get the HAR file, a hash archive, and now you have credentials which allow you to take over other accounts, establish super user, and that's what happened to Okta. At first, they said it was less than 1% of their customers. Then they came back and said, no, it's, it's all of them. Uh, HPE had the same thing. Microsoft had that. So, you know, what's what's the goal? Well, the, the point is that you just have to remain vigilant. Uh, you have to put in telemetry in the system that you are protecting to detect evidence of an attack, to detect evidence of the offload of a large amount of credentials, to detect evidence that is uncharacteristic for service accounts, to detect activity on accounts that are marked as uh, as as obsolete. Uh, many years ago, I was CTO of an identity management startup called Waveset. We called on a very large fiduciary in the greater uh, Boston area, and our analysis showed that they had 17,000 employees, according to HR, and they had 34,000 employees, according to the identity management system, because they never got rid of obsolete accounts. Now, those are vulnerabilities. Uh, in fact, it appears that the Microsoft hack just reported a couple of weeks ago was caused by what should have been an inactive account. The point isn't to throw a rock at these people. The point is just to say that even the big guys can stumble. Don't feel bad. Just move quickly to fix it. All of these vendors are, are vulnerable. So what do we do on our side as individual users? Um, the best solution for now seems to be use some kind of passkey. Um, it's essentially an implementation of public key so there's nothing that hangs around on your server. It's not fishable. Uh, stuff, you know, vanishes over time with, with the exception of the, uh, the evil Genix kind of man in the middle attack. Uh, private key never leaves the device. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's relatively protected. Um, that's probably the best thing we can do right now. Um, who uses them? This is as of a couple of weeks ago. Lots of people are using them, growing numbers. So we've got Microsoft, Google, Amazon, uh, NVIDIA does. Uh, some gamers are using it. Some, uh, uh, those of you who remember the hack against um, Log4j, that was actually discovered by people playing games on Discord. You put a message into Discord because you want to talk to people who are playing different games. It turns out that the message processing in Discord won't just take it as text, it'll take it as input and execute it if it can. <laughs> it's log4j, it uses log4j. So they discovered that this mechanism for taking a message and passing it along and decoding the message if it's a pointer to something uh, is used all over the place. So being able to use a uh, passkey uh, type uh, multi-factor authentication uh, means that you are protected from that kind of hijinks, that kind of log4j attack. I, I do want to talk briefly about this. Uh, this may seem a bit out of band. The, tra the target with an identification mechanism is proving you are who you say you are, and that's where biometric assertion happens. Authentication says I want to be able to prove it. As I mentioned before, the problem with using an identification technology such as biometrics is that you can't change it. You can't change your voice in response to a hack. You can't change your iris scan or the pattern of blood vessels on the palm of your hand or the pattern of, you know, nerves under the tissues of your face. You need to, that's an, a strong assertion of who you are. So I distinguish between identification and authentication. And in fact, um, where you see the literature, they're kind of smushed together. They really shouldn't be. They really should be uh, dealt with as uh, as separate. Underneath passkeys and you know, certificate authorities is public key cryptosystems. Um, all public key cryptosystems rely on a core algorithm that is very hard to reverse engineer, factoring a large number, finding a point on an ellipse. The problem is that when we have quantum computing, 
uh, we will be able to um, factor large numbers. Uh, Shor's algorithm shows you how. Uh, I've played with Shor's algorithm, a couple of absolutely beautiful pieces on uh, infinite series, if you can track down that PBS series on what is Shor's algorithm, how does it work, and so on. Um, essentially, it uses a function that is kind of like a beat frequency with cancellation for those things that do not solve the factorization problem. <clears throat> so the question is, how long until quantum computers are real? Uh, right now, NSA says we're probably good till 2035. Uh, there are a number of problems with making quantum computers real. One is, you know, how stable are they? How long will they last? Persistent problem with error correction. Uh, there was a paper published just last week that talked about improving error correction for quantum computers. The rate at which the big players have been going after this, uh, Microsoft, Google, IBM, uh, and a couple of independents, seems to follow a Moore's Law-like track. So the raw number of qubits seems to be doubling annually, and we're now up into four figures. People that I've spoken with in the business say that once we get about 6,000 viable qubits, then we'll be able to crack 1,000-bit RSA. Um, if it were just a matter of the number of bits, that happens in 2026. With error correction and other issues, it may be longer, but I think 2035 is a little optimistic. And the problem is that in order to resolve this, we're going to have to swap out the uh, algorithms that are not uh, resistant to a quantum computing attack and replace them with the post-quantum encryption, uh, possibly as soon as you know three or four years out. The last time we had to swap algorithms was when we went from DES to AES. And that started in 97, it was completed in 2001, and DES was finally retired in 2018. This is not a fast process. Um, and NIST only released the first suite of quantum safe algorithms uh, earlier last year, and they were out for eight hours when one of them was discovered to actually be fairly hackable. So there are gonna be some stumbles along the way. The point is that we see advances in error correction. We see growth in the number of qubits, and I far left out the U in qubit. But whether it's uh, five years or eight years, I mean, to say it's going to be 11 years before we have to worry, uh, I think that's unduly pessimistic. Um, we need to figure out now what we will do when we have to swap out the algorithms and all of our PKI infrastructures. Uh, that's a hard problem and will take a while. Uh, so... Um, I've moved through this rather quickly. Um, here's my bottom line. Use multi-factor authentication with passkeys. Don't worry about SIM swapping if that's the alternative, using a phone as a device. If that's the alternative to using a weak password, use your phone. In Europe, by the way, um, when you call your bank from your phone, uh, using your, your app on your phone, and ask for a transfer, before they send you a one-time password, they use a standard API to query the cell carrier. And the question they ask is, has this device had a SIM swap in the last 48 hours? And if the answer is yes, they'll just fail the request. So you don't see SIM swap fraud in the UK. And that's been the case there for about four and a half years now. So we have ways of blocking that. We just haven't gotten on our ho horse and chosen to ride down that path. So we can we can solve the SIM swap problem. But in the interim, use MFA, use passkeys if you can. There are some passkeys that allow you to leave the passkey physically in the device. That's a bad idea. Don't do that. If you're going to use a password, use a long password and prepare to migrate your encryption system. At some point, we're going to have to roll a PKI. It may be four years, it may be eight, but most of you are going to be working in the field when that happens. So figure out how you're going to make that go. And here are some references. I've got a couple on the next page. And if there is any, uh, are any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Thank you, Bill, or someone pretending to be Bill. <laughs> uh, um, 
if anybody listening in has some questions they have for for Bill, please put them in the Q and A, um, and we'll get to those. Um, I wanted to to ask you, Bill, uh, just to get things started while people are entering questions. Pass keys, as you're using the term, is that the same as the way Google is using the word pass keys for their development? That's that's exactly what I mean. Yes, and I I put it as a single word in the in the document. I'm pointing to the Google pass key. It's based on FIDO2 authentication. It uses a uh, public key crypto system system, and what's in the device or the software is a uh, a private key. So yes, pass key is the carrier for a the uh, private key in a uh, public key crypto system. And think of it as a uh, was that X509 R1 certificate on steroids? Is that the right standard? Yeah. 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 Well, I'll just add that um, there have been some criticisms by several people. Uh, Lauren Weinstein was one of the ones I, I recall seeing um, that what you're doing to protect the passkey may just be something like a four digit ID to get into your phone. Uh, or or a biometric. So in effect, the pass key isn't really adding that much if someone's able to gain access to where you store the key itself. That's um, it. yeah. Any comments to that? You're, you're exactly right. Um, I have I have a work phone and a personal phone. My personal phone has a, well, let's just say it's shorter than six uh, characters, six digits. Um, and and that is a vulnerability. And if I lose my phone, I'm hosed. That's why I actually use a physical uh, key. This isn't anywhere. And the nice thing about this device is that it has near field, so I can use it as an authentication mechanism for apps on my phone. So my Google uh, Docs, my Gmail on my Android phone is secured with the this pass key using its near field communication capabilities. But yeah, if, you know, putting putting a $5 lock on a room that contains a $1,000 painting, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really help you. You've got to, you've got to look at the entire chain. And, and the fact is, again, if somebody really wants the crown jewels, they're not going to try to reverse engineer, uh, you know, public key. They're going to bribe a guard the uh, the gang in Florida apparently fished anybody they could find on LinkedIn or Facebook that worked for a cell phone carrier and seemed to have the chops to be able to access the uh, the subsystems that would manage who owns swim sims and then they just offered bribes to over a hundred of them. Well, if you offer bribes to a hundred people, ninety six of them will say no. And it only took one person to say yes, and that was how they were able to get a hold of some uh, some sims and swap them. And they went after targets who had large uh, crypto uh, accounts, uh, cryptocurrency accounts. So, yeah, you gotta you gotta protect it, but you've got to take a look at the entire, if you will, supply chain and see what the most vulnerable piece of it is. If I can put a keylogger on the phone, you know, I maybe I don't need to get you to fall for a a man in the middle attack. Right. Well, you've got several questions here. Let's start. The first one is, uh, do you have any thoughts about password managers in this context? Um, well, first, um, I do like uh, the idea of using a password manager. Um, I I actually don't use one myself, but that's because I'm 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 not a a, a super uh, expert on this. I have a um, a set of passwords that I've used for a few years. It's a very long list. Um, it itself is encrypted. And so I just rotate through that very large set. And no, it doesn't have my initials and it doesn't have the year and it doesn't have the months. It's it's something much more bizarre. But I would strongly urge you use a password manager. However, if you're gonna use a password manager, don't use a browser-based password manager. Uh, use something a little more robust because if the browser uh, fails, if the browser gets hacked, well then then again you're uh, you're in uh, in trouble. So use one, but don't use browser based. 
Great. Um, second question is, what's your typical password length? And I'm not sure what what the your part is, whether you in particular or people in general. Well, every character gives you another, you know, 26 fold increase in complexity. So um, with, I like to see long passwords. I like pass phrases. I and mean, it was a few years ago that companies started shipping routers that had uh, canned passwords that were like, you know, round robin 884. I, I like that password. That's a nice long password, you know. My name is Sam. I like green eggs and ham. Twenty six characters. That's a, that's a good password. Don't don't go for eight, ten, or twelve. Uh, the funniest password story I have: there was a large bank in New York. I won't mention the name. This was quite a few years ago, but it started with the letter C, <laughs> and they ran a Unix program against it, and discovered that you could actually hack, like thirty percent of the passwords in less than a minute. Uh, using a uh, Unix uh, password cracking program, the um, CIO uh, got on the horn and he announced to all the employees that uh, this result had showed that they are not secure. And so by the end of the day, he wanted everyone's password to be unique. Well, by the end of the day, every password was U N I Q U E. So <laughs> I like, I like passwords that are, you know, 12, 16 or longer passphrase is even better. You know, uh, picture yourself in a boat on a river. I mean, even if my license plate is, you know, Beatles fan and the banner over my desk says fab four forever. I mean, they put out 200 records, you know, which, which lyric from which song. Yeah. Longer. Great. Great. Yeah. Um, I, I use a password manager with a generator and uh, where possible, mine are between 16 and 22 characters long. Right. Um, but not every site takes them that that length. So. Right. There, there is that issue. Um, then the next question here is, uh, could you please reiterate, how does the evil jinx uh, differ with regards to man in the middle attack. Okay, well, let me uh, get back to that guy. Um, a man in the middle, a man in the middle attack is going to attempt uh, to get there by using a variety of ticks, like ARP cache poisoning, for instance. You know, the uh, the system you want to attack is here. It goes through a router, and the router goes to a device. And so, what you do is you bombard the router with ARP updates until the fellow on this end of the router thinks that you're the router and the system on the other end thinks you're the user. You've just inserted yourself in there by being able to hack a password on there. Evil Jinx does not do that. Evil Jinx gives you a screen which you log into and then they immediately pass it to the target system. So you don't notice a delay. And the mechanism that you're using to get to this thing is only mediated by the Evil Jinx um, screen itself. So it, it's not a matter of using some complex out of band uh, thing. It's just a, uh, a, a very sneaky attack that relies on you. You know, one time they don't have to fish you. They just have to get you to click on a link. You know, uh, we're from the IRS and you have to click here in order to correct an error in your account. Oh my God, the IRS click and, you know, when we're done. Um, how can we be sure that the firmware for the physical pass key hasn't been infected during manufacturing? Ah, uh, yes. The uh, Bloomberg report about um, somebody putting a grain of rice size uh, device onto, uh, onto motherboards. Um, how can we be sure? Well, again, if... If you're part of the, um, you know, the MIT Science Fiction Society, you're probably not going to create your own fab uh, to generate a miniature device that you can stick into a, a circuit board and slip into the supply chain for Intel or AMD. If you're NSA, 
or if you're uh, you know, China's intelligence services, then you might do that. Um, the only way I can think of to be sure about that is to do some very deep uh, testing to you know, spray a bunch of inputs into the system, check the outputs and see if you see any side channel activity. Um, outside of national security matters, I don't think that that's a big problem right now, but I'm not going to say don't worry about it. I'm going to say on a scale of one to 10, give that a five. There are probably eights or nines with accounts that haven't been properly shut down or permissions that haven't been properly unwound and so on. I'll just offer for the audience that there are such things as trusted fab to produce the hardware and firmware. Well, the firmware has to be written by trusted personnel in clean room environments. It's very expensive to do those kind of things, but nation states are generally customers for those. Uh, for us, unless we're targets of nation states, they're really, as, as, you, as Bill said, th there really aren't any guarantees. Yeah, I mean, if somebody with that kind of resources wants to go after you, then you just, you know, move your collar down and hope that the knife is sharp. Um, <laughs> you know, that there are some things we can do and, and some things we uh, we can't resolve. I, I just try not to be that interesting. Um, I, I too, I, it's, 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 it's a problem, you know, I mean, for both of us. I mean, we're both, you know, handsome, well-known, sought out speakers. So yeah, we can't help but have the bullseye right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another question is not related to the topic of the talk, but I, I think an interesting one. Uh, someone has heard your podcast and asked, what encouraged you to start a podcast? Oh, well, thank you for that. Um, I really, really want to help make the world a bit safer. Um, it is tremendous satisfaction to me to see people being able to do things for for years when i lived in in another town here in connecticut i was actually the the um uh, help desk and tech support rep for my neighborhood and i realized that some of the things i was saying i was saying over and over again so um the podcast that i ran with uh, greg young uh, real Cybersecurity, we made uh, 75 issues of that <laughs> excuse me and that was just a lot of fun there's a lot happening the the field of information security uh, well i've been working in it for 50 years now uh, i've got 10 gladwells and i i tell you folks i learn something new every week what other what other career has that and some of the stuff is enlightening and some of the stuff is thought provoking and some of the stuff is downright scary like what brian krebs discovered about this uh this uh, gang but if we work together I mean, I, I can't give you 50 years of my experience, but I can give you the Cliff's notes. And if it helps somebody, you know, get out of a ditch or, or avoid falling in, well, you know, that's that's my bliss. Um, so, yeah, it's just to try to get the work out. In fact, um, just a few weeks ago, I started a second series called A Bit of Security. And believe it or not, that URL was available. So I've got a bit of security.com and I'll be moving uh, posts there. They, they show up on various social media. Um, that's that's not the purpose of the event. But yeah, keep those cards and letters coming. Uh, I'm WJ Malik at everything. Um, <laughs> Twitter, X, uh, knock.social, Gmail, AOL. I think I've got a prodigy.net account in there still. Uh, what about your MySpace account? I do have MySpace. I haven't looked in on it in a while, but I will check it. Yeah, I uh, I established accounts on lots of those social media sites simply to preserve the username, not to actually use the accounts. So I've got one there too that I don't think I've been on to in about two years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there other questions in the Q and A um, from anybody in the audience? Uh, wonderful. Uh, if Anybody listening in in the next week or so uh, is interested in some of the references 
that Bill had on his slides, do you keep in mind, well, actually after a, about a week, uh, the recording of this will be online, available through the website. So you can go back and visit it. And if that poses a problem to you, uh, you can contact me. I have a copy of the slides, or of course you can contact Bill directly. I'm happy to share the information. Uh, nothing in here is a trade secret or violates anybody's intellectual property. And so, you know, PDF versions are certainly uh, available. Um, well, if you were violating trade secrets or protective orders, uh, doing it on this video is probably not the best idea. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I'll note to everyone that a link to Bill's podcast was entered in the chat to everyone. And you can uh, certainly check that out. I believe I'm appearing on it in a, sometime in the next 10 months. Um, but um, thank you again, Bill. Uh, for everyone who's listening in, please keep in mind, we do this every week at the same time, and uh, we hope to see some or all of you here next week for our next speaker. So thank you again, Bill, and goodbye, everyone.